As I say, I don't remember a situation like that where a guy is as competitive and as quick as he is, he's getting in the car in the entire season knowing that he's going to be fired at the end of the year. It's a bizarre thing that Ferrari are doing. If I was Red Bull, I would definitely um, seriously be thinking about Carlos Sainz in that car. But again, from Carlos's point of view, does he really want to spend the next five years being Max Verstappen's teammate at Red Bull? You know, that's the next thing. Is that the, the great deal for, for Carlos either? It's... Um, it's a difficult one for him. To me, that penalty was a complete joke. If the FIA actually think he was brake testing George Russell, he should be banned for a race or two races. It's the most dangerous thing a racing driver can do anywhere in the world on any circuit. And a brake test, if you all know what a brake test is, it's at and center. He was the master of brake testing. 87 Belgian Grand Prix. A brake test is flat out on the, on the throttle just a very quick jab of the brakes and off the brakes. So the guy behind has to react and you, you, or he hits you in the back. And that's exactly what happened. Nigel reacted, moved to the left, and there was a, a young he caught the back of Ayrton's car. And that was a classic brake test. Talk to Martin Brundle about Ayrton brake testing in Formula 3. Hello and welcome to another F1 Hour with me once again. I'm privileged to say Mr. Peter D. Windsor, my friend, your friend, the legend, the goatiest goat of all, all <coughs> F1 goats, of course, how could I? How could I misintroduce my friend, your friend Peter D. Windsor? How are you doing, sir? Yeah, good mate. Good. Yeah, here in Melbourne, and a uh, bit of a sultry Monday morning, but otherwise, yeah, good. Good to be in Australia. You're looking. You're looking well, sir. How did you ingest the Australian Grand Prix? <clears throat> Excuse me. I um, I loved it. I was. Uh, like everybody, I was blown away. That's right. I mean, excuse the pun by uh, by Max's problem. Although I had spent a lot of the weekend talking to quite a lot of the teams about potential brake issues that seemed to be on the horizon everywhere. So in a way, it wasn't a real surprise. Um, I guess it was a surprise that it was the Max Verstappen car that had the main issue. But then, yeah, I mean, Carlos just finished off the job he'd done in qualifying and he did that job so well. He was. I, I think he he enticed Charles into overdriving in Q3, uh, and, and overdriving is not normally an issue in Formula One, but it was in in Melbourne because of the softness of the range of Pirelli tires, and that that red soft tire was crazy. And and Charles just got on top of it and then just overused it in, in the middle of that lap in sector two probably, and 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 that was because he's under pressure from Carlos yeah? and. and all credit to Carlos for that. And then Carlos just needed to translate that advantage into the race win. I was a bit worried that there might be contact between the two of them at the first corner, but Lando put pay to that by getting between them. And, and after that, Carlos just drove an impeccable race. And what can you say? You know, Max Verstappen, Lewis Hamilton standard. It was just superb. His control of the race, his extension of the, the first stint, which then enabled him always to have the grip advantage in the, in the subsequent pit stops. So pleased for him. You know, he came to this race uh, a little bit sort of vague i think about what his life was gonna give him in the, in the future with oliver berman getting all the yeah. all, all plaudits after saudi arabia and and his dad was here and and it was a really closely knit carlos science group that sort of got him back on track and and he just he was just superb all weekend he's making believers out of skeptics isn't he peter Everybody apparently now is a was always on the Carlos Sainz junior right. bandwagon. Well, <laughs> I mean, people may say, oh, Windsor's always been saying that, you know, Leclerc's better. I still think he's, Leclerc's technique is definitely ahead of Carlos's. But I've been saying for the last 18 months that Carlos has found a way of of a getting into a groove around the way he wants to drive the car. And he's found the way of not going beyond that when he when he when he's under pressure and that's what he's done in the last 18 months and he looks really good in the car i think the biggest it's not the skeptic so much as, the, as what ferrari must be feeling now and what <laughs> half of italy if not more than half of italy must be feeling about splitting up this combination the charles leclerc carlos science combination which is working so well now yeah yep talk to me a lot of the chat in the communities around carlos science being the tortoise to charles leclerc's hair that he has this ability to to optimize for his very um, specific and and narrower skill set as versus Charles Leclerc vis a vis his race savvy and strategy, tire management, and his ability to kind of do it when it matters most. What do you think about that, Peter? Do you think that's worth a mention? Uh, no, I mean my my assessment of the Ferrari team at the moment 
is that Charles not thinking about Carlos at all unless Carlos goes quicker than he does, which mm-hmm. is what we saw this weekend. And then he goes into slight, as we, we can say it, he went into a slight panic mode. He overdrove the car. But otherwise, I don't think Carlos enters his peripheral vision in terms of setup or anything else. It's, it's Charles Leclerc, and, and he, he goes the way he wants to with the car, and he's quite right to do that. I mean, he has his own way of driving and uh, and he is extremely quick and extremely good. So I don't see as any more than that, really. I mean, the, the interesting dynamic now is that there is obviously a division there now because one guy's on a multi-year mega contract and the other guy's being sacked at the end of the year. And I can't, I was trying to remember, I mean, maybe you can remember, the last time we had a race-winning driver in a team who knew that he was going to be sacked at the end of the year. And, and, and the news had been announced before the season started. I don't ever remember a situation like that. I remember plenty of race-winning drivers being sacked at the end of the year, but not knowing they were going to be sacked 12 months in advance, if you see my point. So I think uh, Alonso wasn't sacked in 06, but I think he announced that he was going to leave at the start of 06 to 07. Um, I'm trying to think of another Yeah, but he was kind of in control of the situation. Yeah, yeah I agree. He, the door was open at Ferrari for him to stay. Yeah, Damon as well. Sorry? Damon in 97, maybe? At Williams, you mean? Yeah, I think he was Yeah, no, announced. but again, again, he the offer was on the table for Damon to stay at Williams. He just wanted more money. That was a, oh, wow. So there's no parallel there. It, it, this is a different thing. And regardless yeah. of what Carlos may or may not have said, he was out and wow. there was nothing he could do about it. And I, as I say, I don't remember a situation like that where a guy is as competitive and as quick as he is, he's getting in the car, in the entire season, knowing that he's going to be fired at the end of the year. It's a bizarre thing that Ferrari are doing. The more I think about it, the more odd it is, really. Yeah, yeah. Maybe they might live to regret it. There will be somebody on the grid picking up a bargaining Carlos Sainz Jr. at some point. Maybe Plessy, Toto Wolf. maybe, I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, the only, the only scenario that makes any sort of sense for Carlos, really, is to be the plug-in driver at Mercedes for a year and then go to Audi for a long-term contract. But the problem with that would be maybe potential mercedes audi conflict he'd have to keep the audi deal secret if you like and do the mercedes deal but even then it's not a great thing because just to be plugged in next to george russell at mercedes is he gonna have is carlos gonna really enjoy that year you know it's it's not not going to be fun for him and it's beyond that it's difficult to see where where he can win races and enjoy his life it's difficult you know ferrari is the place for him to be yeah. It's the whole thing's got a kilter now. It's kind of really strange. Yeah, you said, I remember you saying that the world feels a bit wrong in F1, a, a bit unnatural mm. on the latest well, stream. I think it does, yeah. And, do, and, yeah. do you see any way that Carlos Sainz Jr., because I thought for a second that Red Bull might be sniffing around him. Do you think that's still an option? Or um... I think they might. I mean, they, they obviously, not obviously, but I think after the Australian Grand Prix, some people who were not really thinking about Carlos, I'm talking about team people now, might suddenly be thinking about Carlos and potentially Red Bull might be saying, you know, he did the job. He's the sort of guy that Max would be happy with, uh, whereas Max wouldn't want Charles in the car, I wouldn't have thought, but he would be okay with Carlos. And Red Bull might be saying uh, he is quicker than Perez and does a better job and maybe we should get him. Against that is the other side of the fence, which is Perez brings quite a lot of money, A and B, he does the job that they kind of need to be done anyway. And yes, it would have been nicer to see the Red Bull further up the results yesterday from a Red Bull perspective ahead of the McLarens probably. But at the same time, Max Verstappen feels pretty good right now. He's going to Japan with confidence that he's perhaps even better than he thought he was. Because look what what Sergio could do in the car, nothing. And then he was going to win the Grand Prix in his mind. So in a way that boosts Max's confidence and in a way that sort of that's Perez justifying his position. Not that you really need to do that with a guy like Max, but if you're going to have a number two driver who's never going to tread on the toes of a guy like Max Verstappen, then that's going to be one of the things that is a byproduct. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if I was Red Bull, I would definitely um, seriously be thinking about Carlos Sainz in that car. But again, from Carlos's point of view, does he really want to spend the next five years being Max Verstappen's teammate at Red Bull? You know, that's the next thing. Is that the, the great deal for, for Carlos either? It's, um, it's a difficult one for him. It's a poison chalice of a, a second seat at Red Bull, isn't it? Yeah. Let me let me and if, he, and if he commits to Audi, he's going to commit to a year in twenty five when it, driving the kick Sauber midfield at best. I mean, that's not going to be very attractive to him either, is it? No, especially when they can't even sort out themselves a decent pit stop with them cross threading 
real nuts and stuff. They couldn't even keep it. Well, there was a, I mean, fairness to them, and it wasn't their team, but there was quite a lot of drama before the race about air pressures into the airlines for the air guns. And several teams were were in trouble with those and spending a lot of time trying to get the air pressures right for the air guns. So uh, I shouldn't, we shouldn't be too critical of a specific team till we know exactly what the problem was. Yeah, fair cop. Peter, let me talk to you. Let me pick your brain on um, what I feel, feel is the hottest story of the weekend, being yeah. Fernando El Plan Alonso's incident with one George Russell. Um, mm-hmm. How do you react to that? And what do you make of the the communities for all? On what side of that fence do you find yourself sitting? Uh, well, I don't know about fences. I, <laughs> I, I'm on the, on the side of the fence that I think we can sometimes have too much information, Aldous Huxley, if you like, because if there was no telemetry uh, reading all, all the stuff that the FIA have now announced, I don't think we'd be saying, oh, well, that was a massive brake test and Alonso's at fault. We'd be, we'd be kind of understanding what he was saying and we'd be wondering why. Well, we, we would know that George was confused by it all and went off, but I don't think the brake test word would be coming out of anybody's mouth. But the minute you see something like he braked 100 metres earlier than he previously had, mm. then everybody goes into a brake test mode. I mean, if if Alonso was trying to brake test, um, if he was trying to brake test George, it was the most incompetent brake test I've ever seen in my life. I mean, what was he doing? He was he was braking a little bit earlier, but not particularly hard. Then he was downshifting, then he was upshifting. I mean, that's not a brake test. That is probably what Alonso said he was doing. He was just sort of playing around with entries to try and get a, a quicker exit. However, I would say this. If it's there's no problem in playing around with your entries and exits, but should you be doing that with there's a guy half a second behind you? That's the point. If you're on a free road or the guy's two seconds behind, mm. yes, you can do it. But if, if the guy's in the toe and you've got DRS, we're in the DRS world. I know Alonso's talked about other races, but we're in the world of DRS now. And he would have known or should have known that George was right behind him. And you don't start at that point playing around with entries. That's that's the, what I would say. But I don't think it was a break test. I think it was Alonso genuinely, you know, trying to trying to play around with what he wanted to do with the corner. And, and it caught George out because you don't see that very often. And I go back to the point. I think because now everything is carefully measured, the FIA then have to implement a rule into which this information fits and then penalize the driver if if there's no defense and there were, uh, from their point of view there was no defense he, he he broke all these rules in the in the articles and they made, made the penalty but here's the biggest point and i don't know how many other people are making this to me that penalty was a complete joke if the fia actually think he was brake testing george russell he should be banned for a race or two races it's the most dangerous thing a racing driver can do anywhere in the world on any circuit. And just to penalise him effectively 20 seconds, which all, all that did was elevated his team boss to a higher position. So Aston Martin probably think it's a great result. And, and what else? He got three reprimand points or something. I don't know. I mean, it was nothing. And 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 that that is the biggest problem. And luckily nobody was hurt. But we need to be very careful about this, jumping on this. And it's almost as bad as what Lance Stroll was doing, did actually to Fernando in the in the US Grand Prix. It wasn't a brake test, but he just moved over on him on the straight. And he did the same to Vettel the same year, remember, in Brazil. And that sort of thing, when you're on the straight, when the cars are in a straight line, that is when we need to be really, really strict about what you can do. I'm not talking about weaving under braking. I'm talking about what you do when you're flat out. And a brake test, if you want to know what a brake test is, it's at and center. He was the master of brake testing. 87 Belgian Grand Prix. A brake test is flat out on the on the throttle, just a very quick jab of the brakes and off the brakes. So the guy behind has to react, and he, he, or he hits you in the back. And that's exactly what happened. Nigel reacted, moved to the left, and there was a, I think he caught the back of Edmund's car. And that was a classic brake test. Talk to Martin Brundle about it and brake testing in Formula 3. Those are brake tests. We don't see them very often. I don't think the Villeneuve-Ralph Schumacher thing was a brake test in in Melbourne in, what, 2001 it was, when poor Graham Beveridge lost his life. That was more just coming out of the throttle a little bit earlier, and it wasn't a sort of jab. A brake, t- a real brake test is you're still flat out, and you just jab the brakes. And luckily, we don't see that very often. But that's why those rules are written the way they are. And if, as I say now, with all that telemetry, everything that Alonso did according to the telemetry fits into the wording of that 
rule yeah. and he broke the rule, then we certainly need to look at the penalty that was handed out because that, that penalty was absolutely ridiculous. It was either a break test or it wasn't. Yeah. No, agreed. It's weird, this determination from the FI. Again, another line of thinking from the community is that had George not been involved in such a serious accident where he was half upturned and in the middle of the track, that the stewards probably just wouldn't have even looked at it right. So they're almost more concerned, should, I suppose, the question to you is that should the FIA find themselves more concerned, more focused on the processes as versus the outcomes well, I'm not sure you're right there because surely George would have told Mercedes what caused the accident and he, his story wouldn't have changed. Uh, and even if he'd spun off you know, he, he, and not hit anything, he still would have said, what was Alonso doing? You know, he was breaking early, doing this, doing that. And they would then have gone to the stewards and they would then have looked at the, the data. Surely that's what would have happened. There's no way George would say, oh, it was all my fault. I wasn't concentrating on whatever. But I mean, to be seen to be doing something right, if, if, if George carries on and there's no big accident, it's almost like, I guess, that the stewards probably would have just turned a blind eye as they had done very, well, very recently with Alonso. Not, who, not really, uh, because we was, see quite a lot of that. We see quite a lot of that business of somebody on the outside going around the outside and then they run out of road and then they get on the radio and said, oh, he had me off. He had me off. And immediately the stewards get involved. So it would be that, wouldn't it? That's what would have happened. And George would have lost ground to Alonso and he would have got on the radio and said, what's this guy doing? He braked early. Even if he was on track, he still would have said that. And at that point, the FAA would then have got involved with, with the stewards looking at the data. Yeah, yeah, it's a good Every shout. team is always trying to drop the other team in it. Of so yeah, <laughs> George yeah. wouldn't have lost any time on that one. But but because of the, the size of the shunt, he didn't need to say anything because it was obvious that the FAA were going to look into it anyway self-evident no problem, need the problem as i say coming back to it the problem is the amount is the access to the telemetry because it immediately takes away the human judgment of whether that was a break test or not and and if if the rule if the only penalty for break testing is the penalty that we saw applied yesterday then they need to completely revise immediately the the, the severity of the penalty for break testing because that's just not good enough you know we lost a marshal in 2001 uh, for a similar incident, it was it was higher speed. It was flat out on the straight, and uh, and because of that, we need to be really, really careful about anybody doing this sort of thing again. Wow, it's a brilliant shout, Peter. Uh, let me ask you finally on this. Mm. Again, this is a a line of thinking that I'm hearing within the community that many are saying that already F1 is overly sanitized. That it's a far cry. F1 in two zero two four is a far cry from even F1 2013, right, just 10 years ago. And that George Russell, as an example, if he was driving with Ayrton, who you cite, would have to wear diapers. Like that that sort of brake testing is some serious stuff as versus the, the borderline brinksmanship that Alonso did at turn nine yesterday, right? Um, um, yeah, not you I'm referring to here, but I don't really understand that argument because brake testing or anything remotely near to brake testing is not part of being a good racing driver. It's not part of the skill set that mm. any racing driver should even think about. So I think people who are, who are saying that are kind of a bit confused as to what racing drivers should or should not be doing. Brake testing is completely out of, out of bounds for everybody. In terms of close racing and making a move and making a pass, yeah, I've made the point several times that this ridiculous rule of if you're on the outside and the, the guy on the inside edges you out, that it's your that it's his fault, not yours. Mm. I've always said, you know, that the inside of the corner is the guy that owns the corner. If you're on the outside, you take the risk of running out of road. These days, there's more, there's far more law weighted to the driver who's taking the risk yeah. on the outside. It's wrong, I think. That's the one thing that I would change, and I think that's what uh, a lot of people possibly really think without without thinking about it if you see what i mean it's it's something that is not part of motor racing and that needs to be changed if you're on the inside you've basically got the corner yeah. and and to start measuring oh well i was half a car length in front or this or that or it had me off on the inside you're entitled to use the entire racing line all the road if you're on the inside and and that should not be in any way uh, subject to the stewards but it is and that needs to be changed but everything else i think is Okay, apart from the penalty, quite clearly, for what the stewards deem to be brake testing, is nothing like stiff enough. Yeah. Nothing like it. 
Yeah, you know, it should be it should be an immediate one or two race ban if you if you go into that realm of breaking early, break testing as defined by the regulations. And that's why I say telemetry is is a big problem because the telemetry from Alonso obviously does fit the heading of brake testing. But in my view, that wasn't a brake test. That was yeah. Alonso doing exactly what he said he was doing, which was just sort of, you know, trying to get a, a decent exit. And and that's so the rule book really needs to be examined in that area because the telemetry that we have doesn't fit the concept of what they're trying to say. Yeah. No, I agree with you, Peter. I don't think it was a brake test. Not in the true sense of the word. It wasn't a brake oh. test. It was just it was brinksmanship at best from Fernando Alonso. And that's what the that's that's what he does, right? That's what Yeah, and, and, and another point is that I mean for what was it for sixth place or whatever? I can't imagine <laughs> Fernando would start brake testing anyone. I mean, it's not as if they were leading the race in the world championships at stake or something. I mean, why would he brake test him? But he would do what he was doing because he's a race driver and, you know, he does play around with exits and entries. Fair enough. And and to some extent, I suppose you got to say, George, perhaps should have been thinking more that that's what Fernando does or people in the on the Mercedes pit wall perhaps should have been saying that. I mean, do they remember that Imola race with Michael. I wonder how many people on the Mercedes pit will remember that and would have been saying to George, be a little bit wary of Fernando. He does do these things. I don't know. You know, I, I, maybe they were. I, sh- I can't, you know, say because I don't know. But uh, I, I think it, racing drivers need to be very aware of their colleagues and what their characteristics are and what they're likely to do or not do. Lewis, I think, has always done a very good job in that area. But I think there's quite a... The new generation, the new generation, it's not the right word, but I think the way the younger drivers come into Formula One, they're very closeted in a bubble of operation in which they work. And they're not that aware of how other drivers drive. I think with exception, I think Oscar Piastri probably is, but not some of the others. They just live in this world of data and computers and the engineer and, and it goes in one ear and out the other, basically, I think. And that's absolutely bonkers, Peter. How can you, it's naive in extreme to approach mm. and overtake on Alonso in the same way that you'd approach and overtake on Stroll, say? You, you, or, Kevin Mag- or Kevin Magnussen, for that matter, uh, as another guy you'd need to think. You know, you need to be aware of what Kevin does and how he does it. If you're going to be trying to pass him, if you've got a slight grip advantage, you need to know the right way to pass Kevin Magnussen. It's not the same way you would pass Nico Hulkenberg, for example. But I wonder how many of the new generation actually think that way. They probably just think, oh, Haas, Ferrari, I think it's a Haas. Don't know what it is. You know, that's probably probably the, the extent of it all. Yeah, no nuance. PT, you've been super generous with your time. Finally, if we can pick your brain. Talk to me Talk to me about Mercedes and the slump <laughs> that these guys find themselves in. That that Grand Prix for them is a new a new low ebb, right? Like I've I've never seen eight eight time constructors perform as bad as they did this no. weekend. No, it was it was very bad, and 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 I say that was a sort of neutral circuit. I think that's one of the reasons that Ferrari, McLaren went well is because it it didn't specialize in any specific area. You just need a very good car, well balanced car, drivable car, with a decent sweet spot around which you could manage the tires. Not too slow on the straight. Doesn't matter if you if you were medium speed on the straight in in Albert Park. Doesn't matter if you didn't have great traction. All these, it's a circuit where you could sort of get it together. And you would imagine after the winter's work that Mercedes have done, that of all the circuits early in the calendar, that would be the one where this new look Mercedes, which is a little bit easier to drive, bigger sweet spot, all the things that Ferrari have done, you'd imagine it'd be good for them. But it was their worst race ever. And so I'm, I'm at a loss, as I suppose they are as well. I mean, they, they keep coming up with very specific things like the performance on this tyre or that, and Lewis was looking good. I mean, Lewis wasn't looking good. If you're starting on soft tyres on the gamble that the safety car is going to come out on lap one, which was a gamble worth taking from where he was on the grid. No, no, no um, criticism of that. But at least then be super quick on the soft tyres for three or four laps. And, you know, and it's just the car. I mean, for George Russell to be as slow as he was in qualifying, is that I mean that is the absolute limit of that car, and it's they're slower than both of, both of their customer teams or two of their customer teams, and not much quicker than Williams really, were they? So it's terrible, and they don't seem to have got the sweet spot that Ferrari have found. And Ferrari sacrificed top speed over the winter to get to that point. Mercedes seem to have then well, their top speeds seem to be about where they were last year. It, you've got to say on that evidence, they don't seem to have found any more efficient downforce in the car. 
And there was all the talk about James Allison's going to be more involved. As I said, from day one, I wasn't aware that he was uninvolved anyway. And I think it's pretty clear now that his imprint was on the previous cast as well, because if it, if it wasn't, why isn't there a bigger change? And so it goes on. You know, it's a big, it's a big worry, isn't it? Uh, ju- just a tad, Peter. <laughs> this is very, very worrisome for Mercedes and Lewis Hamilton fans, but it is what it is. It feels like they don't know. They, they just don't know. They're, they're well, yeah. spitballing. They have no and I, don't think, and I don't think I don't think Lewis knows. I mean, he can fr- Friday morning the car, or Friday morning and afternoon, high speed change of direction. He was all you know. He just couldn't. You could see he was very very uncomfortable with the car. Saturday morning, I think they gave him more downforce, and he felt happier in the car. He had some grip. He could play around with it. He'd be a bit of Lewis Hamilton again. But then when they put on the soft tires and really went for it in qualifying, they were just destroying the tires and. Yeah, maybe if, if Pirelli had had a harder range of tyres for the entire red, yellow and white, maybe the Mercedes would have had a better weekend, maybe. But then again, you know, you could you could use the other argument, which is that if you don't have the downforce of Red Bull for any given wing setting, at least if the tyres are soft and have more grip, that should help you a little bit because, you know, it, it's a bit of artificial grip coming in from the tyres. But it, it actually hurt Mercedes. That's the worrying thing. And I don't know. I don't, it's beyond belief, really, isn't it? Lost the words, Peter. Both me and you. Yep. Like it's, it's absolutely bonkers. He's hoping mm. they can do something. Maybe at Suzuka, although probably not. A eh, owing to the characteristics well, you know, of that track. Long, longer straights at Suzuka. Long straight in 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 China. They're going to need to be quick in a straight line, which means taking downforce out of the car. So, what are they going to be like? Like up through the S's, the high speed change in direction S's, or through Spoon, or down into the Degners with the understeer and the the right-handers there. You know, it's, I can't imagine it's going to be a great car around Suzuka. Two chances, Peter. Slim and none for the guys <laughs> and girls over well, at Well, you know, Brackley could Paul the brain and George and Lewis could finish one, two magically. You know, oh, my but, gosh, Peter. You know, don't even... Could happen. We, could, yeah. we should never say never. St- stranger things have one, happened in F1. On, yeah, on the evidence of it, Red Bull should be right back where they normally are in mm. the next two races. Because they're they're not like Albert Park. They've sort of got bits of Albert Park, but they've also got a really long straight, and they've also got long, fast corners, and those things are difficult for everybody else except Red Bull. Yeah, yeah. The apex predator currently of the grid are the bulls that are red. Peter, you've been so generous with your time as right, mate, always. No I, worries. I could talk your ears off. Add infinitum. Listen, if you're watching on YouTube, do me a favor and smash the like, drop a comment. If you're listening on a podcasting platform, do me a favor, five stars and a follow. If you're not subscribed to the Peter D. Windsor YouTube channel, then what are you doing with your life and how dare you call yourself a true F1 fan? And go over to Spotify and all good podcasting platforms and be sure to follow and listen to Peter Windsor's podcast, the Short Corners podcast again, market leading settings. Thank you so much, Peter. You're an absolute legend. Thank you, Cameron. It's been Great a privilege pleasure. as Thank always. You. Between now and next time, peddlers, remember as always to look, but never stare.